Why is this old book a bestseller still? It's a story about an America where government's gotten so big and passed so many stupid and controlling rules that people say, enough. They stop producing for others. They go to a secret place and set up their own community where they're free to run their own lives. Four of the main characters are Dagny Taggart, a businesswoman who runs a railroad. The villain, Wesley Mooch, a government bureaucrat who makes rules that control businesses. Orrin Boyle, a businessman who colludes with Mooch. And the hero, John Galt, an entrepreneur who leads a strike that gets the other productive workers to join him rather than obey Mooch's rules. The book is long, more than a thousand pages. So how many people read books this long? Yet seven million copies have been sold. I read half of it in high school, thought it was fun, then forgot about it. But then after I became a consumer reporter and watched government fail again and again in its attempts to make life better for consumers, I read this again and I couldn't believe what I was reading. It was like the author, Ayn Rand, had seen the future. 52 years ago, she wrote a description of what's happening in America now. Explosive growth of government, an increasing number of Wesley Mooch-like rules. Somehow she knew what was going to happen today. If she could see it 50 years ago, why don't more of us see it now? Well, with us tonight are some people who love this book and see that. And here also are some people who think the novel and its philosophy are ridiculous, like you, right? That's right. Why? Well, I don't know. I just think the fundamental principle behind the book, I mean, that you should always be selfish, I just think that's crazy. Like, suppose, for example, you're on a cruise ship and you see someone fall overboard. Surely you have to grab a life preserver and throw it to him, even if it requires, like, spilling your drink or getting your clothes dirty. So you can't be selfish then. And she would say, no, don't? I mean, as I read the book, she says, uh, you know, you're, you're required, and you're not just allowed to be selfish, you're required to be selfish uh, all the time and only think about... Uh, uh, the sort of gains to yourself. So if that person could give something back to you, maybe you'd make a deal with them. But if you had to give something uh, to that person and give nothing, get nothing in return, you're, you're not only are you not required to help them, but you shouldn't help them. Uh, my objection is that Ayn Rand says that the government stands in the way of people reaching their human potential. But how are people going to reach their potential if they don't have quality public education and health care and a clean environment that the government provides? Government has to provide those things. I think. All right, well, let me take those points to our first guest. John Allison is chairman of BBT Bank, and you love this book, right? And you, so your bank is the ninth biggest bank in America. Yes, sir. Y you give Atlas Shrugged to your executives and ask them to read it. I do. I Why? Do. Uh, because I think uh, Rand's ideas are very powerful, uh, although often understood. Uh, she is primarily an advocate of reason. Uh, and the belief that the human mind is the source of all human progress and really the only natural resource. And that for human beings to be productive, they have to be free. And that, that's why a free society is so necessary. It's interesting in academia, they talk about academic freedom, but they believe that business people can produce with all kinds of rules and regulations that prevent them from thinking, prevent them from making independent judgments. Well, what about his point about she's selling selfishness? If somebody fell off the yacht, too bad. <laughs> Uh, that's a very misunderstanding her concept of selfishness. She's really an Aristean in the concept of selfishness as one's pursuit of one's rational, long-term self-interest properly understood. And what that looks like is you should not take advantage of other people because taking advantage of other people doesn't work. People don't trust you. You see that in business. Also, you end up being paranoid because you're trying to manipulate other people. But you also shouldn't self-sacrifice. That what we really are in life is traitors. We trade value for value. We get better together. In our business, we help our clients be successful economically. We make, they let us make a profit doing, doing it. And life is about creating win-win relationships. That, that there are only two stable relationship conditions, win-win and lose-lose. And if we try to get greedy and take advantage of other people, we end up with a lose-lose relationship. But interestingly enough, when we get self-sacrificial, we end up with a lose-lose relationship. So RAN is really about people pursuing their own rational self-interest, but in the context of what, they, what she calls the trader principle, getting better together, uh, creating win-win relationships. And you've used this in your own business by not making subprime loans and not doing eminent domain cases. I don't get the RAND connection. Yes, we made two uh, decisions that I think specifically relate to RAND's philosophy. One, when the Supreme Court uh, dramatically broadened the use of eminent domain where government power could be used to take the property of one individual and give it to another individual, the so-called Kelo decision, we announced we wouldn't make any loans for that purpose. 
And the reason for that is property rights are essential for a successful economic society. In fact, there's more, the single biggest thing correlated with economic well-being is property rights. The, the abuse of eminent domain is a threat to property rights, which is a threat to our whole economic system. And since we're a bank and we depend on property rights, we thought it was in, in principle that we should be opposed to that kind of abuse. We also chose not to do the so-called negative amortization or what, what are called pick-a-payment mortgage. A pick-a-payment mortgage is where somebody uh, borrows money and the interest might, expense might be $1,000 a month, but they only pay $500. Each month, the mortgage gets bigger. Um, at the time... Uh, lots of banks have done that. Lots of banks did it. And at the time, you could make money doing it because you could sell the mortgage in the secondary market. We chose not to do it over a philosophical principle. Going back to Rand's concept of acting in our rational self-interest, we believe that it's in our self-interest to do the right thing for our clients. Because if we do the wrong things for our clients, it's going to come back and bite us in the long term. So we chose not to do those mortgages, not because we couldn't make money in the short term, but we knew a lot of young people were going to get in serious trouble and owe a lot more in the house than it was worth. So we said, we're not going to do this. And people left us and went to other banks, and that's that, their free will to do that. But we won't ever consciously do something that's bad for our clients. In fact, we believe if we do the right things for our clients in the long term, we'll be more successful. And that is very much a Randian concept.